back when scientists were presuming that ocean acidification was a cause for the collapse of oysters in Willapa Bay, but they didn't have the science to support it. And Steve and I went out there and we were among the first anywhere to really sort of put that together. And it became kind of clear rather quickly that this was a huge story. And then a couple times a year, he and I, went, we went back to oysters and Hood Canal. Uh, we went and looked at stuff the scientists were doing in the research labs in Montlake. And every year it just got more and more clear that this was a big story. Um, and you know, other newspapers have written about oysters, other TV uh, news programs have written about oysters, but it was so obvious that that was just the beginning of something huge. And at some point we just sort of said to ourselves and talked to our bosses about the idea that somebody's gonna have to explain to everybody just how big a deal this is. And this seemed like the perfect opportunity to sort of go out and look at a grand scale and scope of a problem that's gonna face everybody. This is one of those classic stories where it's in your backyard because, um, you know, having worked on it now with Craig uh, for four years approximately, and then going all the way across the, the world, halfway across the world, and having an Australian scientist say the epicenter of this story was in, on the Washington coast. And so, you know, it makes you feel good that we're actually on top of this story. So, yeah. Yeah, in a way, it sort of felt it sort of felt a little bit like it was our responsibility, um, because you know because it started here, it was something that people on the East Coast thought was sort of a curiosity. Um, but for us, you know, we've got people who have industries and livelihoods already at stake, and all, they're already feeling the the sort of initial phase of this, and they're like at the they're like at the the point of the spear, and it seemed like you know if we didn't do it, nobody was going to do it. Um, and so that's part of the reason that we felt like we had to. But it's especially cool when you know it's important and you can tell it's important and that you can tell, I mean, I feel like Steve and I know as much about this topic as any other journalist. I mean, I don't think there, ha I don't think there are other journalists who know what we know. We've, I mean, I can't think of people, too many people in this field that we haven't talked to at some point. And that's just cool. I mean, it feels like we are conveying the cutting edge research on a topic that's of importance and that's you know that's sort of that's what you get in the business for and you don't get a chance to do it as often as you like and when you do um you really you know it, it's fun and and rewarding there was just a study i read that came out very recently talking about how fast things are changing on the west coast and how just because of flukes of geography and the way currents change that the west coast is going to see these changes so much faster than other parts of the world and that it's coming now um, at, at a pace that nobody expected even just a few years ago and that sort of stuck with me um, when we were in Papua New Guinea we actually got to see these the these bubble sites and you know it's 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 just impossible to explain how freaky and cool and weird it is to be sort of going through these bubbles that are just sort of like shimmering up from the ground. And, you know, Steve and I are both rookie divers. We have no experience in the water. And as the, it was basically our first experience in the water, and it was just phenomenal. And then seeing the, the plates, the, um, the scientists actually put down plates where they hope um, corals will take root and they did this in a, a healthy coral reef and then again a couple hundred yards away where um, these bubble sites were and then we watched them pull plates from these two places and compare them and you're basically looking at a tiny little microcosm of future coral reefs in both of these places and the difference between them was astounding i mean one of them is just like this it looks like a gigantic rainbow of colors and there's all sorts of cool little things on it and the other one's like brown slime and algae and you know these are like two different pieces of our future depending on how we deal with carbon dioxide and it was like it was really like the single most compelling thing that we saw i'd imagine you know we wanted to go up and and see just uh what it's like to be in the bering sea and to be on a you know on a boat that's that's taking in a natural resource like crab and this in this case it was opelio crabs snow crabs and um, I think if, for the story, you know, we did a lot of interviews before then. 
Craig peeled off and then I stuck with the ship. But what happened, which was unusual, it happens, but it was unusual in that the sea ice came in from the north and covered all the crab traps. And so we went chugging up through the Bering Sea. And when I say chugging, you know, this is a large boat, but I've never experienced where the trough of the boat, I mean, you, the, nose, the bow goes down and then you can just like count and then it pops back up again and then it shimmies side by side. And you're traveling north at maybe four or five knots and the spray's coming over the bow and it's free, it's like 20 below outside and I'm just in the wheelhouse going, oh my God, am I gonna survive this? And this is before I even started shooting outdoors. So um, the, ex the experience really was heightened by um, taking, taking <laughs> my fear, yes, by fear, <laughs> not being able to walk around. You know, th going through ice fields and you know, coming up and hearing this boom, and then the, the boat shakes, and then it goes scrape, scrape. So Steve was able to send emails occasionally out, and then they would come to his wife, and his wife would then forward them to me, and she'd say, what did you get my husband into, and when is he coming home? And he would send her an email talking about sort of the conditions, and then he would send me an email talking about the real conditions that he didn't want to send her and scare her. And I was like, do I tell her that he really thinks he's going to die or do I, you know, because if he does die, she's going to want to know. <laughs> and when I'm laying in my little, my little, you know, my little berth in the bow of the boat and I hear this scraping right next to my head and, and I'm just, I'm flashing on, you know, what, what it's like to enter the water, you know, as a person with, you know, as the boat is sinking. Um, you know, this fantasy kept going through my head because I was genuinely afraid of, of dying up there. It was when we were in Papua New Guinea and we went night diving in water with uh, uh, fishermen who were gonna do spear fishing at night. And you know, Steve and I, are, we're very beginning divers. Um, and this is in, in water that has, there are lots and lots of sharks of many different species. And there are saltwater crocodiles and you know, there's malaria mosquitoes everywhere. And so we're, we meet these guys out on the water and I'm trying to break the ice. And I just said, so we're, you know, we're gonna be filming you, we're gonna be diving with you. And you know, we want to, <laughs> we, you know, we don't wanna see any sharks or anything like that. And, and one of the fishermen said, well, we will try very carefully to get the fish in the boat quickly because when we get a fish on our spear, that's, what, that's when they come. And I was like, wait, you mean that really happens? And he's like, oh yeah, that They're attracted happens. to the blood. They're attracted to the blood from the fish. And so <laughs> the whole time Steve is shooting and he's, you know, he's got his camera down here and there's lights on and it's pitch black outside. It's and pitch black underwater. It's pitch black underwater. And there's no lights on shore because we're in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, he's just getting more and more tense. And finally, when the shoot is over, <laughs> we got back in the boat and went back to the dive boat and he grabbed a beer and like stood in the shower with all of his clothes on, <laughs> just holding a beer. <laughs> and, you know, it's like one of those outdoor showers. Oh, <laughs> and he's just man, like, I'm, I, so I'm, happy I'm done, I'm done. You were alive on that one. I've now over 12 years of working with Steve figured out how to stay out of the way of the camera. So I, I spend a lot of time dancing to get out of, but you know, it, it's, it's cool that it's like second nature now. It's like, I see him coming and I'm like, you know, dodging out of the way. And, Craig, you gotta move, Craig. Hold back just a little bit, Craig. Yep. Sorry. Literally one Canon camera body that I shot both the stills and the video with, and about three Canon lenses, um, along with you know an underwater housing made by Aquatica. So Canon and Aquatica. One of the other really big tools was the GoPro camera, which um, is uh, the tiny little underwater, above water camera that I call it, sometimes call it disposable, but uh, I can clamp it on places that you never want to go. You never want to put your, your expensive camera up on a, on a boom that's flying around the top of the, the crab boat. I hooked it on a, a bag of oysters that was traveling down a chute so that you could, you know, you could actually looks like you're riding on these things as it's going down. It's just a wonderful little device that we use now, especially for underwater.